Hey, 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 welcome back to the Lavelda Show, Women of Power. Today is no different from any other show. This is the show where women share their power tools, the tools, techniques, and strategies which have led in life and business. And my guest today is no different. She is doing incredible work in the world. She's a life coach, best-selling author, and, a, and specializes in codependency and narcissism, which I think is something that we could all do with ensuring that we learn more about. Please welcome today's guest, Lisa Ramona. Hello. Thank you, Lavelda, for inviting me to your show. It is wonderful to have you here. Now, I've got to start right at the top here. Like, how does one get into specializing in codependency and narcissism? I get, I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. I guess the, the, best, the best answer to that is to recover from it. Tell, uh, recovery, okay, so tell me about that. What, what is your story? Were you, was it the codependency? Was it the narcissism? Was it a combination of both? Well, I grew up in a dysfunctional home, although it looked perfect. We were raised to tone ourselves down, to not feel our feelings as it's children in the home. My parents were unrecovered adult children of alcoholics in denial. They had really no understanding of how their childhoods had affected them as people and how that had really affected the way they were parenting. And so as a result of growing up, feeling like I didn't have a self, feeling like who I was was literally bad. I mean, this was something that my mom used to say often, you're a bad girl, you're a bad girl. And I became brainwashed to believe that I had no value, that I was actually bad. Um, by the time I was 21, I was codependent, acquiescing to men, subjugating my needs to men, trying to be good enough for every man that I met, found myself engaged to the first person that would have me and en become engaged to me. And before you knew it, I was married. By the time I was 23, I was pregnant with my first son. And 12 years later, I was a complete mess. My, uh, I had asthma. I had blown out my thyroid. My hair was falling out. I was constantly going to the doctors because I had these rashes that they could not explain. They couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. Stomach issues, couldn't sleep. I was just a mess. And one day a doctor said to me, you better listen to your body because your body is listening to you. And it sounds so strange, but anybody who has grown up feeling invisible will understand when I say it was the first time an authority figure gave me permission to look inside myself, to say that, yeah, whatever is going on inside of you, you really need to look, look at. Because my whole childhood and even in my marriage, I was invalidated as a person. I was consistently told that what was going on inside of me was irrelevant. Um, you know, in a last ditch, ditch effort to save my marriage, I went to therapy. My ex-husband would not come with me into therapy. I went anyway, which I'm so thankful for. And in that first session, he basically let me know that I was severely codependent. I was suffering from codependency and depression, but I was depressed because I was codependent which meant that I didn't have a sense of self. I was a shell of a person and I was people pleasing and I was reactive. I was attached to the 3D and thought that if I did X, Y, and Z, then A, B, and C would happen. And that very rarely happened. You know, people are their own people. They do what they want to do. We think we can control them, but we can't. And it set me on a path to learning everything I could about codependency because the moment came when I realized that I was brainwashing my children to feel helpless. I was brainwashing them to uh, be afraid to set a boundary, to change their life and to move laterally. I was brainwashing them to be afraid to change their mind and to accept that they had a mistake. And I wanted to do something about that. And so that's really how my journey began, was really um, discovering I was codependent and doing everything I can to heal from it. Wow. I mean, there's, a, there's so much in that, and that's such a, such a powerful and also heartbreaking story. You use the word um, brainwash, and I think often you, when we think of somebody brainwashing somebody, we kind of feel like it's an intentional act, right? Mm -hmm. It has that intentionality almost baked into it as a concept. Do right. you think that your parents were, were conscious of it? Were you conscious of brainwashing your children, as you said in your own words at the beginning? Or do you think it's an unintentional thing that people are unconsciously observing, uh, observing words that aren't helpful? I think that 
no, absolutely. My parents were completely unconscious. That was the problem. They were far more conscious than they thought they were. They thought they were doing everything right. They never questioned themselves. They never questioned their level of consciousness or their level of self-awareness, right? So they had horrible childhoods, both born to alcoholics, and yet they never questioned how how is how is this going to affect the way I raise my children? So my parents thought, well, we just we just won't drink, and that will solve all our problems. And yet my parents were highly immature, highly reactive, highly controlling, and never questioned whether or not it was good for their children. Even in my own my own um, motherhood, you know, I was conditioning. I, maybe that's a, a better word for people. It, it's um, it causes less resistance when you hear the word conditioning. But all children are in a, a theta brainwave state up until about the age of seven, and that's a hypnotic brainwave state. And that's for the purpose of being able to download information very, very quickly. You've got to learn a lot about your world in seven years, in the first seven years of life. And so creator and infinite wisdom, I suppose, um, sets us up to be in a theta brainwave state between the ages of zero and seven. And after that, we move into a, a different uh, brainwave state. But from zero to seven, we are literally being brainwashed, meaning conditioned and programmed. But I do not believe that it's, it is um, intentional at all. And that's why I love doing what I do, because I help raise the awareness of people who were raised by unaware people so that they can break the cycle and they can break the patterns. I love that, that you, the awareness of people who were unconscious at the time, because I think, you know, it's true that for the vast majority of us, our parents do the best with what they know. And sometimes what's natural, especially if their upbringing was not what they would have loved to have, is they almost go to the other extreme, right? Well, you know, the drinking wasn't great, so we're just going to be super strict and super restrained and super controlling in order to ensure that that is not the life that my children have. Yep. Unbeknownst to them, that actually it's creating a slightly different sort of problem or challenge yep. for those children because you know, it's not natural for us to have that level of control imposed upon us. That being said, I think you are testament to the fact that just because you've grown up in those sorts of conditions in which you were, you taken on beliefs or brainwashed unconsciously to have a, a structure, uh, a belief structure that isn't really supporting you, does not necessarily mean that that has got to be the case because you're doing pretty well for yourself right now, aren't you, Lisa? I would say so. You know, I'm I'm living my best life. I'm I'm living out a dream of mine to help people. Um, I have to pinch myself sometimes because I grew up feeling so invisible and feeling like no one would ever want to listen to anything I have to say, and feeling so minimized and marginalized in my family. They didn't even realize they were doing it. It was just you know commonplace to criticize, to chastise, to make fun of and humiliate. It sounds terrible, but it was it was the norm. And so to ha have been able to create a career where, you know, people pay me to coach them. People pay money to buy my books. They pay money to come to my events. I literally have to pinch myself sometimes because it is such a complete, it is so opposite to the way that I was conditioned and programmed to believe about myself and what I had to offer the world. So what would you say for those who may be listening to this and thinking, oh my gosh, this is speaking to my soul. You know, I'm feeling like, no, I'm not heard. I, I really, I'm really struggling, especially with, with the state of the world at the moment with the pandemic where, where many people might find that the world that they had before that was just about bearable is now completely unbearable. What were some of the tools like what helped you to move forward because you were doing exceptionally at the moment um i had to recognize that a, a number of things i had to stop reacting to my environment you know um i had to start looking within i had to start focusing on myself i had to start focusing on my feelings i had to start focusing on the desires that i wanted to have i think many of us get we sort of like get addicted to what's happening in the matrix and our brains think that, oh, there's this terrible thing happening and I should try to control it. But that doesn't work because the more you try to control something that's outside of your control, the more you realize you feel out of control, even more out of control. That doesn't work. And it sounds hokey pokey, as I like to say, or very cliche, but the only thing that you can control is really yourself. And so learning to let go of the things that you think you can control that you can't control is very, very helpful. 
And the only way that you can do that, right? One of my sayings is you can't fix a hole in the wall you can't see. And so part of the work that I do is the discovery work that I do is help people recognize what are you trying to control that you logically and rationally cannot control. Let's start there. Do you want your mother to invite you over for Sunday dinner because she always invites the golden child, your sister, and never invites you? Well, you can't control that. You can't control who your mother invites to her home. You can't control what your mother says. You can't control what comes out of your husband's mouth. You can't. But we... What you can control is how you react. What you can control is how much power you get or give to these things that you can't control. That you can control. So learning to um, sort of like let go of what you can't control, I would say, is like step one. I love that because it's we're so like aware of the things that we don't want. It's like, you know, and, and yep. you, can, you can become so fixated on it as well. You're watching it play out and it can become this thing. It like sucks you in. And now it's the only thing that you can focus on. And you're wanting, it's almost like when they can behave in this way, then I can feel good. And I think that's possibly the problem, right? That you're giving control of your happiness and how you show up in the world to the way that somebody reacts to you, which you can't control. <laughs> that's codependency. You know, when I, when I think I'll be happy when, I'll be happy when I have the relationship or I'll be happy when my husband says this or I'll be happy when my wife does this or when my wife doesn't do this anymore. So we're codependent on this thing that's happening outside of us rather than relying on our own selves to generate our own state of happiness within. It's not easy, especially when you are conditioned to think that the problem is outside of you and if you are good enough, someone will treat you the way you want to be treated. So codependency is about trying to get our needs met in a dysfunctional way. That's really what codependency is. So if I feel unbalanced or I feel stressed, then, and I'm codependent, I think the answer must be outside of me. It must be in getting someone to say what I need them to say to, to stroke my feelings, to make me feel better. And then what happens is, now I'm really reliant on this other person for the rest of my life to behave a certain way in order for me to feel good. And there goes my power. There it goes. So it's once you identify as struggling with codependency, then it's so much easier for you to like reverse engineer, figure out why, and then develop life skills to help you detach from these dysfunctional beliefs and patterns. Love it. So that's codependency, okay. that's but you codependency. also... You also support people who are um, who are around narcissists. So how yeah. how do you how would you define that? Because I think it's really important that we look at both of these. Sure. So usually, you know, in in the work that I do, it's not uncommon to find someone who's struggling with codependency who is other focused, right? So I'm focused on something or someone outside of me for a sense of approval or validation or permission to be who I am. Right, very common with codependency. So I'm other focused. When you're dealing with a narcissist, a narcissist is self-focused. So a narcissist feels entitled to exploit other people emotionally. So there's a sense of grandiosity, there's a sense of superiority, there's a sense of entitlement, and they exploit other people. So you can have someone who loves themselves and wants to get a certain place in their career, but won't exploit other people to do it. So they're self-confident and they're capable and they continue on their career path and they, they do great for themselves. That's not a narcissist. A narcissist is someone who wants something and who will exploit other people, lie, take advantage of them, and feels entitled to do so to get what they want for the purpose of appearing better than or more superior than others. So that's the difference between someone who is confident versus a narcissist. And because a narcissist is self-focused, they, their, their relationship style fits like a hand in a glove with a codependent who is seeking an other for validation. So a narcissist feels entitled to exploit someone who has poor boundaries and who they can exploit and make them a source of narcissistic supply. What I mean by that is a codependent generally is going to acquiesce to the needs of the other in order to feel like they are worthy. And so I hope that that explains that dynamic a little bit. It does. And I think it's important to explain it because sometimes, like you said, there's a real close closeness between narcissism and somebody who's just self-confident. And it's helpful to also understand 
if you're codependent, you're more likely to slip into or um, to, to be a narcissist's best friend, shall we say, because yeah. you're more likely to be the person who will bend to their needs because, because that's how you're getting your needs met. Yeah, because you are, you think that you need to chase approval. So when you're codependent, your idea, your brainwashed or conditioned, that's much, much softer word, you're conditioned to think that you have to live a life of servitude, you know, for another person in order to feel worthy. So you don't feel like you're worthy enough just because you are, because you breathe, right? So when you're struggling with codependency, there really is this subconscious program that has a codependent person believing my needs are not important, someone else's needs are more important. And when they come into relationships, they immediately go into caretaking. They immediately go into anticipating this, the needs of this other. Now, someone who is healthy, who's involved with the codependent, might want to push that person back. It doesn't feel natural, right? They're trying to take care of a, an adult person. And it won't feel natural to someone who is healthier and has, has stronger boundaries. But when you're dealing with a narcissist, a narcissist, oh yeah, baby, keep coming, keep coming after me, keep trying to anticipate my needs, right? Keep trying to caretake, keep trying to be good enough for me. They'll absolutely eat it up. And unfortunately in time, you know, once you've been loved bombed by a narcissist, they start to devalue you and then they start to cause arguments. They're very jealous, they're very accusatory and they flip the script. They actually convince the person that they're in a relationship with that it's their fault that they're angry. And oh, this, oh. so this becomes a serious issue. And then they threaten to abandon them, which is the a codependence person, a person's core wound. It's the fear of abandonment. And so now someone who has high narcissistic traits has exploited someone with, with a lack of boundaries, has love bombed them, has made them think that they are everything. And then over time, six, seven, eight months, sometimes it takes longer, the mask starts to slip, the target becomes devalued, the, the target is accused of things he or she is not guilty of, and then threatened with abandonment. And then the person who's struggling with codependency goes right into apologizing goes right into taking responsibility for upsetting the more narcissistic partner and just freezes inside the relationship because they don't know how to confront their fear of abandonment. The hamster's wheel for a codependent is that, number one, you're going to seek approval. And the second thing that will also keep you stuck is that you're going to fear negative consequences or circumstances. And so when you're a codependent, you're seeking the validation of a more narcissistic partner or friend but at the same time, the same time, you're also fearing negative outcomes. So to be healthy, you have to find the, the middle ground. In other words, to be healthy, you have to A, stop seeking approval of other people because you're a grown ass adult. I hope I can say that on your show. And number two, if you're too afraid of a negative outcome, then your brain is going always going to try to scurry to please people and to keep you in these very dysfunctional relationships simply because you are so uncomfortable with being alone or feeling abandoned. So it's really important to work this through. My mother was someone who literally passed away. She's more codependent than my dad. She passed away as a codependent woman without a voice, thinking that the answer was just not to upset my dad. Like literally woke up every day, how do I please him and how do I keep him from getting upset? Now, if you're living that way, you're not empowered whatsoever. You are literally giving your entire world over to this other person who is more narcissistic for the sake of keeping this dysfunctional dance going. And I just, you know, that type, that type of a dynamic and knowing that there are people out there that don't even know they're doing that, that's what gets me excited about getting up in the morning. A dysfunctional dance. I've never heard it referred to like that, but it, I can see the hamster wheel. Like just, it's like there's no winning. You're just going round in circles and no good is coming of this. And fundamentally, no. the more you, you're, I, and I love, like the more you want to help, the more you want to save, the more you want to dive in and be the person to, to make everything better in everybody's world. I think you forget it's not possible for everything to always be 100% in anybody's world ever. It just doesn't exist like that and it's not your responsibility. So I love that you say that there's this idea of getting to the place where you can stop looking outside of yourself or 
seeking the validation from somebody else in order in order to feel fulfilled. Is there yep. a top tip that you could give that might at least start somebody on that journey? So if somebody's watching today or listening in today and they're thinking, oh my gosh, Lisa is speaking to my soul. Holy heck, I did not realize that was me. Every word she's saying is just dropping in there and got me thinking I'm in a situation and I need to get myself out of it and I need to get myself out of it quickly. Presumably it's not, you know, there's a risk that somebody goes the other extreme. That's it, I've got boundaries now. Yep. I've got boundaries now and I'm not, I'm not taking any nonsense from anybody. I'm guessing that's not necessarily the right way to go. Is it, what, what's the first step or the, the stepping stone that will help to shift somebody who may now notice that this is a pattern that's playing out for themselves to a space where they can be more empowered and less disempowered? There are so many tools that you can use to break this down to help you. And I think, it, number one, this isn't going to happen overnight. You know, healing from something called codependency, it's, it's, a, it's a way of living. You know, you're probably not just codependent in your relationship with your spouse or your partner. You may be codependent with your children, with your in-laws, with your mother, your father, whoever, your sister, your siblings. It's a way of being. So it's important to recognize that it's going to take time and that consciousness is the way. Einstein says that you can never solve a problem with the same level of intelligence that created the problem. And so it is with codependency. You're never going to be able to solve the riddle of codependency with the same level of consciousness or awareness that created it. So step one is really re uh, recognizing that you need a spiritual awakening. You need a rise in consciousness, right? And then you have to recognize that what you're doing is when you're codependent, you are bi spiritually bypassing. You're not in touch with how you feel. And so I created something called the one, two, three process. I need processes during the day to help me make it through just to make it easy. And so the one, two, three process is really something that I created to help my clients and those who take my coaching program learn how to connect with their feelings. So step one, accept how you feel. Stop ignoring you. You don't feel, stop pretending you don't feel what you feel. Stop ignoring red flags and turning them into green flags. A red flag is a red flag. And so get in the habit of saying, that is a red flag. I'm not going to ignore that that's a red flag. And I'm just going to go into the bathroom for five minutes and just see what it feels to acknowledge that I'm not happy right now. You know, my husband, my wife just said something or embarrassed me rather than sweep it under the rug. I'm going to spend five minutes asking myself, how do I feel? How do I feel? How do I feel? That's going to reacclimate you, reacclimate your conscious mind to your feeling body. You're dissociated from your feeling body. And if you continue to detach from your feeling body, your emotional body, then you're not going to be able to set boundaries because how you feel is what tells you, oh, that was a red flag. I feel like I just was just kicked in the face. Like, I feel like that person's being passive aggressive. If you continue to ignore that, then you're not going to be able to live your life by design. You will live what you've always lived, and that's just not enough. So step one is, what do I feel? Even if you find that you're envious and you're jealous of somebody, it's okay. It's a normal human emotion, right? We all have an ego. And an ego is designed to help us, really help us um, find our eye. But when we're wounded, ego's a little annoyed and develops ego defense mechanisms. It's okay that you feel jealous. It's not okay to stay unaware of being jealous and then destroy your relationships because you're jealous and act like a fool. That's not okay, but it's okay to feel jealous. So step one is just accept how you feel, right? Step two is to recognize how do you know that you feel this. How does your body tell you that you're jealous, right? Is it the thoughts that show up? Is it a heavy feeling in your chest? Do, do your ears get hot like my ears get hot when I'm angry? Does your heart start to skip beats? How does your body tell you, uh-oh, red flag, red flag, red flag? So connect to that, honor that, because your body is speaking to you. It's trying to help you. This is the way spirit works. The third step is your money step. So this is where you need to make a decision because what happens with codependents, they might feel a red flag, but they don't know what to do with it. So they slip it under the rug and they pretend that they don't feel it. They become very resentful. They might even hate people below the veil of consciousness, but they don't do anything about it. They stay stuck. So the third step is make a decision. Now, before you can make a decision, you have to ask yourself, what about this can I control? What about this can't I control? And ultimately, ultimately, how do I want to feel day to day? 
if you can answer that question, like for me, the answer that, to that question is, I want to be free of codependency. So then if I backtrack, so let's say my sister asks me to watch her dog, and I told my sister not to buy another dog because I'm not watching this puppy anymore, and she asks me, and I notice that I'm angry. Step one, I'm angry. Step two, how do I know I'm angry? My stomach feels like she just kicked me in the stomach. Okay, body's telling me, pay attention. Third step, what decision do I have to make? What can I control? I can't control that she bought the puppy, and I can't control that she asked me, even though I asked her not to. What can I control? The decision that I make. I can watch the dog. I cannot watch the dog. I can have a conversation with her. Any of those things I can do. But how do I want to feel? I want to feel at ease. I want to feel like I'm being authentic. I want to feel like I'm being transparent. I don't want to feel like I'm being used. What decision is in most alignment with that decision? I think I'm going to have to tell my sister I'm not going to watch her dog because I don't feel like I'm being authentic in watching the dog and I don't want to create a negative pattern and just be honest. I and absolutely if, love that. I absolutely yeah. love it. And I love how, um, how clear it is. Like it gives people a tool that they can move forward with. Um, yeah. This show is the Women of Power show. And the journey you've been on to navigate through what you've navigated through shows me, just tells the world 100% that you, you understand power to go from such a disempowered space to not, not just being disempowered, but understanding the dynamic, transforming it for yourself, and now stepping into the role of teaching others how to get themselves out of that dynamic if they're in it. I'm now curious what your power tools are. So I define power tools as tools, techniques, strategies, ways of being that have enabled your success. And so what I'm looking at is if we take everything you've ever done in life and business and boiled it down to literally just three things that you would say have been absolutely pivotal and fundamental to your success, what would those three things be? Well, I wrote them down because I don't want to forget them. So the first thing is I had to learn to observe my own thinking, which is, I think we should be teaching this in kindergarten. Like our brains have the ability, it's called metacognition. You have the ability to observe the way you think. Now, before I developed this ability, I was reactive. So I had a thought and I thought that it was real. I thought that I never questioned that maybe maybe my thought wasn't real. And so if I walked into, I don't know, a restaurant and I saw a couple of friends from high school, I just assumed if I saw them whisper, they had to be whispering about me. You know, of I was course, reacting. Because what else would they be talking about, right? If it <laughs> if it wasn't you. So yeah. And I think I think it, it, it I get that it's really core cool because you spoke about it in so much detail earlier about the first step is observing. So it makes sense that one of your power tools is to get very clear on what your thoughts are and, and understand that that's what you're thinking and it doesn't necessarily mean that that's a reality just because somebody's whispering at each other doesn't necessarily mean they're speaking about you. Um, what would the second power tool be? That I am the ultimate causation of my reality. And what I mean by that is that, you know, through, through the recovery work that I've done, I ended up at a place where I had to really question the nature of reality. And when I believed I was nothing, my world mirrored that back. I had people in my life that treated me like I was irrelevant. And then I, as I began to change my thoughts and my ideas about myself, and I started to value myself, when I was a single mom with three young children, you know, I invested six, seven, or maybe eight thousand dollars in my first book and that was scary but i realized if i don't invest in myself how will anyone invest in me and so it was the first time i stepped out of my you know feeling in a big way stepped out of my uh insecurities about self and vulnerabilities and said i'm going for it and this is where i am today so as I stayed on that path and kept investing in myself and kept investing in myself and kept believing in myself and loving myself, my entire world flipped. So that tells me that I'm the, I'm the causation. So if I want to live an abundant life, I must see abundance everywhere. If I want to live a peaceful life, I have to focus on peace. I can't be focusing on things that upset me, things that I can't control. And so, and when I do, and when I do, I feel my world shifting in the opposite direction. And so that is how powerful our thoughts and our beliefs are. And so love you can't talk it. at you can't love talk it, at a, love it, love your it. mouth. You can't talk out of both sides of your mouth. The Bible says you can't serve two masters. So if you want to be someone who is living an empowered life, 
You must understand the power of your thoughts, right? The uni you're streaming to the universe, whether you like it or not, we all are, we're all streaming. And our subconscious beliefs are what's streaming. What we feel is what's streaming. There's a big difference between thinking, yeah, I'm happy and feeling happy. There's a big difference between thinking like I have a nice house, I have a nice career and being a worry and being worried that you're going to lose everything tomorrow. Very different. This has to become a congruent um, relationship between heart and mind. You have to become in alignment with what you feel and what you feel must be in alignment with what you want. So seeing yourself as causation would be number yep. two and understanding that you do cause your reality. And your third and final power tool would be Lisa. You have to honor your boundaries, if, even if that means people are going to get ticked off. You know, when yeah. you start saying no, people, people get upset, especially if you're someone who's like, oh, I'll take care of that. Oh, yeah, I'll do that for you. Oh, I don't mind. Oh, we had dinner plans for three weeks and you just changed them because you want to go out with Suzy Q. Sure, it's OK. I'll see you next week. And then they cancel plans on you again. and You go, OK, no problem. That's just not going to work. You know, it's just not going to work because what you're saying to your friend and what you're saying to the universe is I don't matter. And yet each and one of us has come to learn how to live out loud. That's the whole purpose. And we all struggle, but the whole purpose is to evolve and to learn how to empower ourselves and to flip the script. And so you have to be willing to set boundaries, even if that's going to upset people. But again, if you go back to what I said before, the hamster's wheel of codependency is that you're going to seek approval of others and you're going to fear a negative outcome, which is if I say no, so-and-so is going to get upset. So we have to learn to be uncomfortable uncomfort with being uncomfortable while we're setting boundaries. And if you can do that, if you can do, do those three things, you are on the right path. I absolutely love it. And I think sometimes, what's the saying? What other people think about me is none of my business. And I think sometimes it can be a journey to get to a point where you thoroughly can sit within that. So I love yeah. that reminder of the boundaries that we uphold and that my mama used to say, my mom used to say, Lavalda, you teach people how to treat you. I say she used to say that. She still tells me that sometimes. You teach people how to treat you. And I think that's the best way to kind of sum up what boundaries are. Lisa, there's yep. going to be people who've listened to and watched the show up until this point, and they are now having aha moments, and they're dropping in like pennies, and they're thinking, I need some of this Lisa woman in my life, which she just said is a thing. I know you have a affirmations book, is it? Yep. Yep, yep, yep. We have, well, I've written seven best-selling books on, that have gone become bestsellers on Amazon. Again, I still have to pinch myself. But yes, we're offering a, an affirmation book for people who are beginning to understand, oh, maybe I was conditioned to think negative things, and maybe I'm not challenging those negative beliefs, and maybe that's why my life isn't going the way that I want it to. So yes, that's the offer that we're giving. Um, so those will be in the notes. We'll also make sure that it's popping up on the screen for you as well, so that if you'd like to have a copy of that, you can get it. And Lisa, how does somebody get in touch with you as well if they'd like to learn more and find out more about you? I really do suggest that people go to my YouTube channel and you can just Google Lisa A. Romano YouTube channel. I have close to 600 videos on this topic of self-empowerment, self-love, self-care. And you can also reach me at lisaaromano.com www.lisaromano.com. That's my website. Boom. That's all we have time for, folks. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us today. The Absolutely. wisdom that you shared, I know, is going to be transformational. So thank you Wonderful. so much for joining. Thank you for inviting me. You've been listening to and watching The Lavelda Show, Women of Power Show. It has been an absolutely incredible ride and we're not done yet. We are just warming up this season. We'll be back later on this season with more incredible, phenomenal guests teaching you and l l diving into their stories and giving you insights into the source of their power such that you can find the source of your power. Until next time, have a fabulous morning, afternoon, evening, wherever it is, wherever you are in the world. Take care, my gorgeous. Ciao.